let's start so this is the first lecture uh, and this will be introduction to computer vision if you have experience in computer vision that's good if you are hearing the computer vision for the first time then i think uh, it's going to be exciting so computer vision is ability of computers to understand visual data all right so let me try to explain what that means so visual data is like uh, as we know it could be images it could be videos and when i say that ability of computers to understand these kind of uh, data points we want to automate some of the task task which human visual system can easily perform all right so for example let's talk about images so i'm showing an image here so as a human if i look at this image what i see is i see this table right i see this bottom this board and the laptop here the chair the handbag and i am able to do this uh, as like my vision system enables me to do, do that right i can see this bottle and i can see that okay this pixel in this image actually belongs to this bottle or i can draw this bonding box and i can say that okay this bonding box is actually on top of this bottle so now the question is when i show this image to a computer or any ai or algorithm can that algorithm also do similar things can the algorithm say that okay a bottle is present in this image so for for a human it's fairly simple right you can just look at this image and okay you can say okay there are two bottles here but can the computers do that can the computer look at this image and can the, can it draw like a bounding box around this handbag which says that okay the handbag is located in this particular region of this whole image so this is these are like just two simple tasks and when i say like ability of computers so we are talking about those tasks like which we can easily perform so this is kind of understanding this visual data so let's talk about like uh, what are the other fields which are related to computer vision so i think question from sadia this is yolo output i think the, these are just uh, ground truths but yeah of course you can get uh, output from yolo as well we'll talk about that i think in the second part of the lecture you are jumping too early but that's good so computer vision is related to like a lot of other research areas uh, and these are like from biology psychology computer science mathematics physics and engineering and you can see that we need knowledge from neuroscience cognitive science graphics we need algorithms we have information retrieval we have machine learning image processing we have robotics so of course robotics is like when you have a robot there are a lot of sensors like in in that robot right so one of the sensor could be just a camera so if the robot is using a camera then that camera will provide like a visual feed to the robot and then robot has to make inference like what the robot can actually see through that camera in the in the in the surrounding environment right so therefore computer vision is uh, involved but you can see that it's a very small portion because there are a lot of other sensors as well which robotics are uh, which robots use and you can see that there is no overlap with speech which is entirely different speech is something like natural language right so that has nothing to do with vision so there is no intersection between these two but you can see here that computer vision is related to all of these areas which is quite interesting so let's try to understand uh, what visual perception is so there are a couple of questions we first need to answer all right so for example so i'm looking at my laptop right now right i'm presenting here so how do i know that this laptop is actually present here because this is just like what my eyes are showing me right it could be there it could not be there but we know for real it's there but that's a very interesting question so then the follow up question is can we see something without being aware of that so the interesting aspect here is it could be you can just open your eyes stare at something but completely like mute your mind don't think about anything so it's kind of you can get lost in time right so it doesn't mean you're not looking at something you're looking at something but you're not processing it so that is something interesting 
right so another interesting thing is why do object appear like why do why, why do we have like colored objects right so we'll cover uh, this as well so you can go through like the very formal definition of visual perception which says that it's a process of acquiring knowledge about your environment all right so it's it's based on like whatever information you can extract from an environment about about the objects or about the events so you'll have to acquire that knowledge it's not that it's there and then you can you can understand it you will have to do some processing for that okay so it involves like your vision system which enables you to watch something then there should be some cognitive activity which should process that that visual stream and which will give you which will uh, give you that knowledge right what is happening in your environment so this whole process is a visual perception and it's actually analogous to taking a picture and we'll, we'll talk about that so this is a human eye and let's say we are looking at some object or uh, the tree here so what happens is we have a lens and as light like pass through, uh, passes through this uh, lens an image is formed in the retina all right so this is just a visual system and similarly in the camera we have the same system we have object we have a lens here and then the same object like it's formed the image is formed in in the film here right so this is just like the first part the vision because we are just capturing this this object similarly here but to really know that this object is a tree we need to process this information similarly we need to process this information so in case of humans like our brain will process this but in case of images your ai algorithm or computer is going to process this okay so this is a very nice cartoon when he's saying that watch out uh, for that crate right so this guy can see that but it might happen that this guy is also looking at that direction but he might not observe this so that happens a lot so that's why like visual perception is important it's not like just looking at something okay now related to that if you look at this picture i mean what do you see so that's a question for for the class and you can put your answers on the chat so these are just like uh, white dots right or black dots you can see otherwise and if you have seen this image before then you might know this and if you are seeing this image for the first time i'm sure I mean you can't answer this so all the students who are answering this question they might have seen this image before and if you are answering this correctly without I mean uh, and you haven't looked this image before then your visual system it's really amazing okay so right now what's happening your brain is trying to process like these pixels these dots all right and it's trying to infer what might be there it's not clearly visible so it's not able to infer okay so it's not like the the visual perception it's it's not complete I mean, it's it's there but you don't have the semantic meaning all right so most of you like answered it correctly and there is a dog sniffing right so now i have told you i mean there's a dog in this picture now if you look back at this image it's very easy for you to actually recognize that dog so this explains like uh this explains like it, it's not just like looking at something it's being the, it's the ability like to infer to infer the semantic meaning all right so that that's more important okay so let's try to see like uh, how uh, this human vision is actually different from computer vision so the sensing device for humans it's eye right and the interpreting device is the brain so after looking at this image we can interpret that okay a person is sitting he's sketching right there is a trash can there's a light, uh, light bulb here there's a table here we can interpret all those things 
and we are able to do that that because our brain is able to process and we have some prior knowledge as well it's not that simple actually right so we can have all these interpretations now com comparing this with computer vision we have a camera so camera is the sensing device which can take the image of this and then you will have the computer it's like the ai algorithm you have which will process this image which was captured by this camera and then the goal is to be able to make the same interpretations all right so let's try to understand like why vision is so important and why we need to uh, actually do research in this area so visual tasks like as a human which we perform is uh, we actually need to interact with the environment for our survival right we need to navigate so even if you are just walking we need to avoid all the obstacles and we are able to do that only because they have this uh, strong vision system we are able to interpret our environment right and we need to recognize different objects because we'll have to interact with those we'll have to pick them up or maybe do something we need to identify food we need to identify danger so for all of these uh, things uh, this vision vision is really really important we need to differentiate friends from enemies So the goal of computer vision is actually to bridge this gap. So the gap is the images which we can capture using camera and the actual meaning or the semantic meaning which is hidden in that image. We want to bridge that gap and that's why we need to study computer vision. All right. So I think there's a question from Rajat in context of the dog image for an image classification model. Yeah, we are not talking about image classification yet, but still let me complete the question. If the model is told that it is dog during input, will the ability to localize? Yeah, this is not a question from for this lecture. Maybe we can talk about this uh, when we talk about image classification. Okay, you can hold on to that. So a question from Steve. Do basic CV systems handle depth perception of different objects well? Basic CV systems. Well, or does that require specific algorithms or approaches to integrate that kind of perception in? So again, depth perception, it's like an open research area. All right, so in fact, I mean, there is a specific problem which is called depth estimation. Right. And I think we are going to briefly talk about that as well. And given an image, the problem is, can we estimate depth at each pixel? Okay, so it's like an ongoing research. So it's not completely solved. So to answer your questions, they can handle to some level, but to say that it's completely solved, no, we are not there yet. Okay. So I think the second part of your was uh, require specific algorithms or approaches so yeah i mean you can what you can have you can have a depth sensor right so that will give you the depth values that that's one way to handle that's how you do like in robotics and okay so the extended question i'm familiar with basic object segmentation but hadn't really looked at how well models pick out which objects are in front of others if they don't overlap yeah right so that's an open research problem to some level we have methods which can do which can do this but how well they will generalize to like natural environment it's hard to say okay so a uh, question from scott for those of us who did not see the dog does that mean our some of our vision systems are easily fooled it's not about fooling it's also about uh, So it's also about like how your mind is processing uh, that input, right? So for for that particular image, I mean, your mind might be like looking for something specific, right? And it also depends upon which region of the image you're looking at or at what resolution you are looking at the image. So sometimes you might get it. If you're looking at the exact resolution where the dog was present, then you might get it at first, right? So it depends on like a lot of, lot of different, uh, uh, different aspects there. Okay. So, yeah. So the goal of computer vision, as I said, it's like, we want to bridge this gap. 
which is between like the images we are capturing in form of pixels and what's the semantic meaning hidden behind those pixels. Now, this is the image and this is like a captured image and this could be like a real 3D environment as well. So this is something which we see, right? Our human, our human vision system sees. But if we are passing this image to the computer and let's just focus on this uh, region over here, uh, this yellow box, then the computer will see something like this. Right? So this is like upscale version of this patch. And each of these values are like just numbers. So even though we are looking, uh, we can easily infer because uh, this is like an image of a person to us, but the computer is actually seeing these numbers. And that's why it's hard. I mean, how can one interpret these numbers and say that, okay, a person is reading a book, all right? Uh, I think there is a question from uh, Michael. Wouldn't it be the latent meaning? Yeah, Michael, you will have to elaborate on that. What do you mean by latent meaning? So you can use your mic if you want, that's perfectly fine. Yeah, latent is hidden, that's fine, but I didn't get your question. What do you mean by latent meaning? Like latent, latent meaning of what? Probably I'm missing the context. Okay, all right, so that's fine. So if you're confusing that with semantic meaning, so latent meaning is something different. So I'm saying semantic meaning because the semantics of this image is important, right? So semantic meaning means like a person is present, where the person is present. So we, we can see the eyes, we can see the nose, we have lips here, right? So all those details, they correspond to the semantic meaning, if that was a confusing. Okay, so let's continue. So now let's try to understand a uh, digital image first before we see like what a uh, computer is going to process. And we are going to uh, cover this like in the second, uh, in the third lecture as well, when we talk about image filtering, but image is nothing but it's kind of a matrix and a two dimensional matrix where you will have some rows and you will have some columns, all right? And each location in this matrix uh, will indicate like the intensity of this image. And of course you can have a grayscale image, you can have RGB image. So depending upon that, it will, uh, it will depend upon like uh, how many matrices you need to store the image. So for grayscale image, it's like just one value, right? And these values will be integer values. So let me close this. Okay. So a scalar image uh, will have integer values and the values will be between zero and this number to raise to power a negative uh, minus one. So a here is a bit level. Right? You might have heard like a bit level of image. So you can say that the bit, uh, the, the image is uh, a bit. So then these are the possible values, integer values, which can be present in that image. All right, so let's take uh, one simple example. Let's say if we have a eight, uh, we have an eight bit image, right? So if if you have an eight bit image, then you can replace uh, a with eight. This will give you a uh, two fifty five, which means that the values in your image will be between zero and two fifty five. So the pixels in that matrix they could take any value between these two. All right, these two integers. And uh, that is your eight bit image and that's like the standard, but you can have uh, more compressed images. So in this case, zero corresponds to black. So if the color is completely black, then the value will be zero. And if it's like close to zero, it will be like grayish. And if the pixel is white, it will be 255, all right? And similarly, you can have one bit image. So in this case, A will be one. And you can see here that the only values you can have is either zero or one, which means that each pixel will say whether it's uh, white or it's black, all right? So that's called a binary image. 
because it can only have two different values. So let me show you some uh, examples. Uh, so this is a very popular Lina image, which is uh, used for image processing. This is the original image. And this is, uh, in this one we have A equals to eight. And this will have 256 colors. So this colors is like grayscale colors, right? Because this can have values between zero and 255. So this is like the highest level. And if you reduce uh, the quality, in this case, it's A equals to three. So when A equals to three, you can put it there. It will give you seven. So you can have values between uh, zero and seven. So eight different colors, all right? And you can see here that the quality is actually uh, not as good as this one. You can see these patches here, right? And the reason is because you don't have like a lot of variety in terms of colors. And that's why you are seeing like certain changes. In this case, the change was pretty smooth, right? And you, as you move from like, as you move in this region, and similarly, you can have like e equals to two, where you will have four colors and the quality is actually degrading further. Okay. So this is just like how we represent images. And this is a grayscale image, which means uh, there are no colors. And of course you can have colored images. So colored images, uh, you have three different channels, red, green, and blue, and each So I think someone just annotated on the slide, but that's fine. Just ignore this red mark here. So I don't know why that was enabled. Okay, anyways, so all right, sorry about that. Okay, so when you have a colored image, you have three different channels, R, G, and B, and each channel will have uh, a bit values. So each channel is like uh, the, the one we saw in the previous slide, right? So if this is the colored image, then you can have three different images and each of these images is like a bit. If it's, uh, if it's eight bit, there will be 256 different values for each of these, right? So this is corresponding to like a level of red, this is level of green, level of blue. And you can then combine these three it will give you this. So now we are talking about colors. Now human vision system, we have like cone cells and we have three different type of cones. So these are like corresponding to blue, green, and red. And the X axis here, it's showing the wavelength. So the smallest wavelength is corresponding to this uh, blue. That's why this, uh, this abbreviation small. And then medium is for green and L is for this red, which is like the longest wavelength. So this is like a distribution from human uh, vision system. So these cone types, ideally we have these three, right? Blue, green, and red. But some people might have four cones as well, which means they can see like more colors than a normal human being. Okay, so this is really interesting. And some might only have just two cones. So they will not see like as many colors as a normal human being can see. And of course, when I mean, this is not a very small portion, I think around 25% of the population has just two cones or like for vice versa. So it's a huge portion, uh, proportion. So if you have just two cones, you can check with your doctor, then you will be able to see, I think at max 20 different colors or some somewhere around that number. And that vision is like, more close to like what a dog can see. Okay. So these are just interesting facts. And as we know, like this color vision has evolved over a million of years. And this is like the visible spectrum uh, starting from blue. And so the minimum is like starting from this 400 going all the way up to 700. We can see only in this range. And as I said, like uh, we you normally have three different cones. And of course, like if there is no light, we don't see anything. So there will be no color, right? And uh, another interesting fact is, if uh, I will show you like uh, gray levels, you will only be to uh, be able to discriminate few dozen of them, right? But if you talk about colors, you can differentiate like hundreds of thousands of different colors. 
And these are like all the wavelengths. And again, this is similar to like the plot I showed you earlier. Red one is the longest uh, wavelength. And again, there is a range. It's not like very specific number. There's a huge range here. And as you go down, like this is the shortest wave we have for violet, 340 to 440. So these cones are actually uh, around this area, which enable us to like uh, see colors. And um, usually we have 64% of cones, which allow us to uh, see red, 32% green and 2% blue. And we have roughly six to 7 million cones in our eye, eye system, okay? And there is another thing called rods. So we have around 120 million rods. So cones are responsible for like color vision, rods is like responsible for like low light vision when when there is very dark it allows us to uh, see and that's why i think we need a huge uh, huge number of these okay so all right i think there's a question from moment a wavelength of a color is actually wavelength of the light photons that are reflected from an object of that particular color yeah i think that's true so that's fine. But again, these are some facts uh, which are really interesting. Now let's move on to the motivation why actually you should study computer vision. So you might have different motivations, which is fine, but let me motivate you a bit further. So you might find it interesting. You might, you might be just taking this course uh, out of curiosity. That's also fine. And it could be like just your course requirement. But let me show you something else. So earlier, like uh, earlier days, this computer vision research, this used to be done mostly in academics, right? Industry was not doing anything. But these days, if you go out for jobs, you will see like companies, all the big companies like these, uh, which I mentioned here, all of these are doing computer vision research. All right. So the question is what changed? And the biggest change is deep learning. You might have heard about it, heard about this, and the this was mainly due to advancement advancement uh, in this hardware. All right. So the availability of different uh, GPUs, which are very very powerful, which allow us to do like which allow us to process a lot of lot of data. All right. So these two things like together, they cause emergence of uh, of deep learning. And in terms of large scale data, you know that like we have a lot of lot of social media platforms out there where there are a lot of images, a lot of videos, which can be actually used for learning. And those kind of platforms are actually used to create these data sets. So these are some of the data sets which are used in computer vision research. ImageNet was the first, like uh, the large scale one, but now we have like much bigger. Okay, so in terms of market, like of computer vision, you can see like uh, even in 2015, it was growing a lot. And this is, uh, until 2022, you can see that it's still growing, all right, in all the sectors. It's not just robotic or machine business, like right from automotive, medical, retail, agriculture, everywhere, we need computer vision. And that's why like almost all the companies these days, they need computer vision to, to make their products. Okay, so we were talking about research so CVPR, uh, this is Computer Vision Pattern Recognition, the top conference in computer vision. And this I'm showing here is the ranking of all the conferences in engineering area. So when I say engineering, it covers everything. And the CVPR is at the top, followed by advanced materials. And again, this ICLR and NeurIPS, these are again machine learning and computer vision conferences. So the metric here is this H5 index and H5 median. So let me explain what, what this H5 index is. This is also interesting. So H5 index is the papers, the number of papers in the past five years. That's why you have a five year. So the number of papers in the past five years, which have gained more than this many citations. All right. So citation is something like when you write a research paper, then other researchers are referring to your work. So that's called citation. So it means that if uh, the H5 index for this conference is 356, it means that in the past five years, there are 356 papers published in this conference, which have 356 or more citations. 
okay and this is h5 median this is just like median of all those papers so you can see it's pretty high now that was engineering now if you take like uh, all the areas all the areas of research so nature is on the top and you can see that cvpr is at rank four and this covers like all the areas of research everything and which is which is quite intimidating intimidating okay so i think there are some questions uh let me cover those quickly uh, probably i will go to the questions later let me see what else i have uh, and this is just showing like uh, the number of papers which are being submitted in these uh, in this conference like say cvpr and you can see that it's increasing year by year so this year uh, there were around like more than 6000 papers which is a lot right and out of these submitted papers only 23 percent were accepted so this is roughly i think 1400 or so so which means that a lot of people are doing research in computer vision and this is the attendance and uh, i don't have for this year because it was virtual last year also it was virtual but you can see in 2019 it was like close to 10,000. and i was attending this one i think it was in long beach california and they had booked like a very big convention hall and it was all full it was crazy out there so you can see that starting like in these 2008 and 9 like at max 2000 right or maybe 2500 but 10000 it's crazy so uh let me go through the questions first so this we covered so Steve is asking, grayscale makes edge detection easier. What are the other considerations when working with CV with, when would you consider using? Okay, so we are going to cover these topics later on. All right, we will see like when we need HSV, when we need RGB. So this is fine. We'll cover that later. Fernando has a, has a question. Uh, grayscale is only good for dimensionality reduction. Uh, that, that's not entirely true. Grayscale can be also useful for edge detection and you can perform dimensionality, re, re, uh, dimensionality reduction in RGB as well. So it's not specific to grayscale. Okay, a question from Julie. Grayscale would be meaningful if color doesn't matter. For example, stop light. Yeah, that's true. That's a good point, Julie. And a question from Brandon. Any good tutorials you recommend? So tutorials, I'm not sure. I mean, you can check the reference books, uh, which, uh, which I posted like in one of the slide that will help you. Okay. And of course, like if you are uh, attending the lectures, it should be like self-sufficient. You don't need anything else. Okay. So question from Sanjay, as a computer vision researcher, do you really think that the gap between the human and computer vision has been bridged to a certain extent? so as to complete with humans great you could rate it out of 10 and this is something which i'm going to talk about in this lecture later on and it's not it's not that easy and as you will see like there are some tasks in which computer vision is actually far ahead than human vision and that's not due to human vision it's basically due to like the processing time and in most of the things, I think still it's far away from uh, what human vision can do, but we'll talk about that, but that's a really good question. Okay, so let me quickly uh, talk about some of the applications uh, of computer vision. So you might have seen like Amazon Go, they have a retail store like in Seattle, where you can just walk in and So can you hear the audio? No. Oh, okay. So let me mute this and I can give you the commentary. So this store is like, you, you can just walk in, you can grab whatever you want and just move out. That's it. You just have to tap and tap out and you will automatically build. So all of this is possible due to computer vision. Of course, there are a lot of other uh, sensors as well, but computer vision plays a big role here. Right? Because you have to identify like the object which you picked and 
and based on that you will be able to build that uh, build that person so this is really interesting one recent uh, progress we have seen in computer vision then again uh, it, it it's it's very useful in retail where you want to maybe stop uh, shop lift, shop lifting and i think this video has some issue it's not playing sorry about that and again so the idea here is when you are uh, doing automatic or self checkout then if you pay, place some cameras there which can actually identify if you are scanning all the items or not so then you can do all 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 all, all these things right so this is another application this is another interesting application uh, in retail where what you can do is if you are trying like uh, different clothes then in real time it can show you how those clothes will look on you okay so this is really interesting so again you you need a uh, computer graphics for this apart from computer vision and all of these are like uh, real life uh, applications and then this is the like most famous you all know this self driving cars so <clears throat> this requires like this requires you have a lot of cameras uh, in the in the in the car right and of course I mean apart from camera you have a lot of other sensors which are actually sensing the environment continuously but vision plays a very important role here because when a pedestrian is like walking the road then you need to identify okay there is a pedestrian and the car has to stop right or you need to detect there is a stop sign or there is a red light so a lot of computer vision involved and again it's not just one problem it's like a combination of a lot of different computer vision problems which we are going to talk about in this course and again this is just autopilot from tesla same thing all right so next uh, we have the different computer vision task which uh, we usually solve in research so we will uh, separate all those and then you will see like how uh, they might be applied to any one application where it's not just one problem it will be combination of multiple tasks and i think today we are almost out of time so i will uh, cover these topics uh, in the next lecture and let me see uh, if there are any other questions okay so question from julie why does this never make me look fat that's not a question so was there any other question which i missed right so as i said we are going to cover a lot of topics in this course and bear with me uh, sometimes we'll have to move pretty fast but again you can ask questions i will be, i will be patient with uh, patient with you and uh, we'll have office hours uh, you should uh, make use of that and office hours try to book an appointment if you can because as i said there are 100 students in this course so i don't want you to like wait uh, in the queue that's not good all right and we are there to help you we are uh, there to guide you throughout the uh, throughout this course to make it easy for you so that you can uh, learn all the things which you want you to learn so i think there is a question from rajat in the context of rgb values is there any significance of 256 or it's a random number 256 it's not a random number right it's not a random number so i uh, let me go back to that slide so if you have a 8 bit image then 255 is like the maximum value which you can have in your image which can be stored in in a, in a pixel right and if it's 255 then starting from 0 it means that you can have 256 total values right this term right here so 256 has uh, its it's significant does it answer the question rajat so a comment from michael brown it's a matter of storage capacity and that's true so if we don't have enough storage capacity then we might want to store our images as not 8 bit let's say 4 bits so then it will be like just from 0 to 127 so that will require like less space okay all right 
So I think another question from Steve, as a follow-up to that question, do you see many applications of cameras that capture 10 plus bit? Uh, I think there are, but I'm not sure like uh, from deep learning point of view, it might not be relevant, right? Because anyways, what we do is if we have a eight bit image, even that image, uh, we take the pixel values and we scale it down to zero and one for normalization. So all we have is like long values. So having a nine bit or 10 bit uh, image, I mean, it's more detailed, it's fine, it's more refined, but from a deep learning point of view, I don't think like it's that important at this point. And again, it, it might vary from application to application, but for most of the problems which we are going to talk about in this course, uh, I think it's not that important, okay? Uh, so another question from, let me scroll up. Lawrence, can you explain why it's two raised to or A as opposed to any other base number? Yeah, it's just a definition. It's just a definition and it also relates to like how uh, the the computer memory is organized, right? <coughs> but it, it's not important at, at this point. So it's, it's just a description, all right? So I mean, there are a lot of optimizations and I think we should not go there. So I think another question was Scott, back to the dog picture. If you looked at more pictures similar to that one, would we get better at seeing those hidden objects in new photos where most of the image detail is missing? And yeah, of course you will be because, and again, as I said, it depend, It all depends upon the context. If, if I asked you, okay, this is the image, can you see a dog? I'm sure I mean, all of you will be easily able to locate that dog. It will not be that difficult. So it's all about context. And it's it's about like what you're looking for. Okay. So I think a comment from Julie, base two is easiest for computer decision making. Yeah, so that's related. So that's a comment for you, Lawrence. Okay. So if you are taking, or if you have taken, uh, the what we call that course uh, computer organization or computer architecture i think then you will be able to relate it well okay so your infrared cameras can go to 16 bits some dl tools are built for 8 bit those careful implementing them yeah that's true and even like some other uh ranges like you can have not just infrared, uh, you can have uh, other sensors which actually try to capture at higher bit level, but that's fine. And the comment from Ethan, the image is stored as binary. So again, that's a comment for you, uh, Lawrence. The more data you have, the better you can train your model. That's true to some level, but not entirely. Okay, there are some limitations. So that's a comment, I can skip that. Are there any computer vision applications with single pixel cameras? Yeah, I'm not sure about that. I will have to check. But I'm sure, I mean, if there is a single pixel camera, there should be some application, right? Okay, so that's fine. Question from Brandon, would it better to train models on higher or lower bits? Yeah, I mean, so most of the models, they are trained on 8-bit. And as I said, you normalize your data, you make that between zero and one. But usually like most of these models are trained on 8-bit, okay? And if you go down to like 4-bit, of course, the performance is going to be bad. But going from 8-bit to 16-bit, I don't think there will be a lot of improvement. It will be just like a lot of memory consumption, which will again impact the performance. So there will be some trade-off. 
but 8 bit is something which is normally used. All right, so that was the last question, and I think we are almost out of time. And so let's end it here. If you have any questions, uh, write me an email. You can contact the TA as well. So I will I will see you in the next lecture on Thursday. All right. Bye. Have a great day. Thank you, sir. Thank you.